here I am back. I know many of you are delighted that I am because of this fascinating story I'm telling you. Some, of course, are disappointed that I am back, and you go do your own thing and I'll do mine. Now, here we are once again with Amy Semple McPherson. Last time we saw that she was involved in a, uh, in a love nest and with a cock and bull story about being kidnapped in Mexico and so forth. The district attorney, Asa Keys, had really no choice but to go forward with a prosecution of, the, of Amy and the, and the mother. So at this stage, things begin to happen of a very, just unbelievable, it sounds like something out of the Wild West, basically. I mean, it involves perjury and the uh, wit witnesses vanishing and changing stories and one thing or another. There's money is just gu gushing out of the <laughs> out of the temple, obviously blackmail and so forth. And uh, so, uh, to give you some idea, one woman who was originally had said that she was the in the love nest in Carmel with Armiston, not Sister Amy, not Sister Amy. Well, she changed her story and, and reversed it and said that she had been paid by Ma and, and Sister Amy to make this, this claim of being in. So people all, the, the case collapsed really because of just this, this, you couldn't get anybody to tell the truth for any length of time. That's what it amounted to. And, uh, but it, there, in, in the following years, an awful lot of money was missing. And probably once again, there probably was blackmail involved in all of this stuff. Poor Asa Keys. Years later, he got himself in trouble. I think he, I think he went to prison for, for bribery or something like that. Ma and Amy had actually bribed a judge, twenty five hundred dollars. Claimed it was for legal advice. Well, judges aren't supposed to be giving legal advice. Very badly tarnished. Now, I mentioned to you that I believed that Ma Kennedy honestly believed that her daughter had been kidnapped. I, I believe that. But when that ransom note came, why that, that was a collapse of the thing. They, she obviously knew the daughter was responsible for it. So the relationship between the daughter and, uh, and, 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 and the mother began to disintegrate. Not alone for all of these reasons, but for another reason as well. Amy was demanding more and more money. Uh, for example, they finally settled on a scheme where she would get the first, she would get the collection of the first Sunday of any month. Well, we don't even know what kind of money that was, except to say that it's just a people just gushered money on, onto, the, onto Amy's operation. Amy began to appear in furs and and uh, expensive perfumes and and jewels. The latest uh, Paris fashion. She was in Chanel and uh, and Scavarelli and all this stuff. Well, it finally came to a point where she and the mother split. And uh, this was bad news for Amy in a, in a number of ways. She lost the guidance of a very wise woman. And incidentally, I might tell you that Ma Kennedy was a hell of a, uh, at uh, preaching herself. When, uh, when sister was, wasn't doing it, the mother was. And she was a great, uh, contributed much to the temple operation. But as I told you earlier on, she could spot the, the, the deadbeats the crooks, the hangers-on, the, the groupies and all that that just exist for the purpose of getting money. She, they were no longer there. So now they had all kinds of flaky people in the, in the temple doing rather odd jobs for nothing. Money is going out. They're in constant trouble. Uh, and Amy's coming up with fresh schemes for getting money. Take a trip to Europe with Amy. Go to the Holy Land with Amy, you know, that kind of thing. Or how about this? She has a, a cemetery. Be buried where Amy's going to be buried, you know, the sort of kind of crummy things, which came to nothing, incidentally. They, they lost more money than they ever made. Now, what happened was that she became more and more a very lusty woman. Uh, we know, <laughs> we've been through the Ormiston thing. She had uh, property all over LA. There was a huge, Parsonage, right out the side of that temple in Los Angeles. You can see it to this day. It's huge. It's two or three stories high. Just an immense estate. That was the parsonage, so-called. Amy didn't live there anymore. She had a home in Santa Monica. She had a uh, home in the Silver Lake area of Hollywood. 
She had a Moorish castle in Lake Elsinore, and as it turned out, she had a love nest not more than two or three blocks away from the temple. And uh, we, we know that as a positive fact because there were dissidents in the temple who knew what was, were, they were suspecting that things were happening that were not just right. And they hired uh, detectives. And detectives discovered this love nest, and they discovered that Amy and one of the temple members, who apparently was her lover, had all kinds of secret uh, bank accounts in uh, fictitious names. So, you know, not good, not good. One person who claims to have bedded uh, Sister Amy, I, I think this is his choice, Milton Burl. Now, of course, many of you, you young folks will have no idea who I'm talking about. He was a famous vaudevillian who, uh, in the, around 1949 or so, came on to television when television was in its infancy. He became a super, superstar. He was a clownish kind of guy. He was a, a, just the lowest kind of comedian. And he tells the story that in the late 30s, he was playing the RKO Theater in, uh, down in the main, uh, main, main part of Los Angeles. And Amy saw his performance, and they, uh, they went to one of her love nests and uh, had it on. Burl was famous for two things. He apparently had the apparatus of a horse, and secondly, he was very much a ladies' man, and uh, uh, that he says he was involved in something like that is probably, at least probably true in any case. What can you say? Well, now, I've always said, said these things about Amy. It's at this point I want to turn the thing upside down and say an awful lot of good stuff about Amy. From the beginning, going back all the way into the first in the early 20s when she opened that temple, she started a social program of, 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 of great importance, really. And it grew to the point that it was well known all over Southern California, but most especially in downtown Los Angeles, because many people were able to take advantage of it. In 1929, there was the Great Crash. By 1932, in the depths of the Depression, the misery all over the United States. 25% of the population was without work. In the big cities, there was un unemployment. There wasn't much for the counties to do. They didn't have a tax base. Relief amounted to just maybe getting, you know, <laughs> rotten vegetables or something, anything for people to eat. It was, it was a terrible thing. Amy's operation, this is where she really came through. They already had the basis for it, as I say. They were, they were well geared up for it. Small things you might not think about, but very important. People used to do stitching in those days. She would get collections of clothing and repair them so that they could hand-me-downs. She had enormous amount of this stuff that was being turned over constantly. She had an operation for unwed mothers. Now, you think that this doesn't mean anything anymore, an unwed mother, it means meaningless. Those days, you were, you were a social outcast. No one had anything to do with you. You leave town, whatever. But in any case, she had a program for unwed mothers to try to get them uh, employment, to try to get them through the, uh, through, uh, the birth uh, and, and get housing for them, all that kind of thing. They had a nursery at the temple. Now, this is an amazing thing. Here, the women come. They, uh, married or unmarried made no difference. What are they going to do where the, where they, where the, the mother has to work to support the children? The father may, may, may have vanished or, is, or he himself is not working. They had a nursery to take care of the children. She had a prison f fellowship. Now imagine that. Most people would have nothing to do with somebody coming out of, the, out of prison. And, and say, the hell with him. He's, he's paid his debt to society, but he's, he's, he's damaged good. The hell with him. No, they had a prisoner fellowship which uh, tried to rehabilitate them, keep them off of drugs. Uh, well, drugs were not that important in those days, but alcohol certainly was, keep them off the, keep them off the sauce. All these things, they had a rent subsidy. If you couldn't pay the rent, Sister Amy would pay it for you. Now, when you, you were under an obligation that when you did get work, that you, were, you should pay it back, but of course, many of them couldn't, never, couldn't do it. There was no effort to pursue anybody for the rent money. All these things, and add to that, was race-friendly. 
Now, I'm talking about America that was as racist as it could possibly be, and we're still emerging. We're not out of the, we're not out of the woods on that one even now. We are not. We have a president who is, is colored. That's something different. I mean, that's a tremendous amount of progress. But many of the men, people that hate him, hate him not because of his policies, but because of the color of his skin. That's just a fact. Amy had no notion as regards race. She simply didn't believe in it. She embraced, and I mean by embraced, by hugging and kissing people of race. And so blacks and Chicanos and everybody, Filipinos, were invited to her charity and to, and to her services. And this was particularly important in Los Angeles because they had a huge population of, of, of Mexicans and other people from Central America. Many of them, as today, were here uh, <laughs> illegally, and so they couldn't even apply, if they, even if they had wanted, for, for, for charity because they'd been denied them because they weren't citizens. Made no difference to Amy. They were welcome. She would not tolerate anti-Semitism. She absolutely forbade it. She said, if you claim to be a Christian and you hate, and you hate the Jews, then you are no Christian. She even went to, are you ready for this? She even went before KKK Ku Klux Klan rallies and preached against anti-Semitism. That's what, that's what in your mouth. That's a pretty strong statement, I'd say. Well. This is how it went in through, through the 30s, and the, there was a falling off through the years of uh, publicity where Amy was concerned. Less and less was heard about her. She continued her operations, and I'm going to bring this to, a, to an end by telling about her end, which was very, very strange. World War II came along. She uh, spent an awful lot of time selling war bonds. It was very important for the war effort, and uh, she was a champion at it. The Hollywood crowd, you know, the movie stars were selling, she beat the socks off of them. She could sell more bonds in a day than they could in a year. It's the kind of woman she was. Just, she wouldn't, just couldn't stop her. She, they were planning a revival in Oakland, California, at the uh, Civic Auditorium. This was in 1944. Amy f flew up from, uh, from Los Angeles up to Oakland, and she was pretty tough to do in those days because getting airplane tickets uh, during the war years was, was tough. And it, why an evangelist would get any priority, I can't imagine, but she, she, went up, she flew up with her, her entourage. They had a revival at the auditorium that night, and which was marked as a huge success, apparently. She returned to her home. Uh, it's in downtown Oakland on, I think it's on 14th Street. <coughs> Excuse me. It's called the Leamington. It's there now. I think it's a senior for senior housing. Huge hotel. And uh, she, uh, she was greeted by her followers. She had a, a, people all over the place, and she was, she was tired from her effort. She was getting a little bit. She's over 50 now. And uh, she retired to her, to her room. Uh, and uh, the following day, her son, uh, it was now, what, 7 or 8 o'clock, and Amy, no, Amy had not appeared. And he was concerned, but on the other hand, he felt, you know, she said, Mom's been doing so much, and she was, I'm going to let her sleep through. Well, at 10 o'clock, she was still not up, and he was now very concerned. So he went into her room, and he found her there, more, almost more dead than alive, and her head on the pillow, and there was a, a bottle, em, empty, em, empty, but there were two or three pills on the, uh, on the pillow. And uh, at about that point, Amy expired. Well, now you had a very dicey situation, uh, because this is a, this is a, you have to report a death of this kind. You don't just get the body out of town. <laughs> well, that's the kind of thing that she probably would like to have had done. But in any case, <clears throat> the coroner, they, so they, uh, they did an autopsy. And the strange thing was this. She was taking, uh, what she had been taking was second all. And she had taken a dose that would have dropped a horse. Uh, second all at that time was a very rare thing. It had just come out, I think, at Abbott Laboratories. It was a very, very powerful, powerful barbiturate. Used, incidentally, even in our, in our generation, I think Marilyn Monroe checked out with that stuff. Very powerful. Well, Amy had had it taken a horse's dose of this stuff. The bottle had no label, so it didn't say what do the doctor had prescribed it. Nor did it say what pharmacy it had come from. It was just a plain bottle, which was very, very strange. Now, so this led to a lot of speculation. 
Had she just simply overdosed, as sometimes people will do, they take it and don't realize it's working, and then they take more and then forget it's where you take Or was she a junkie all the time? Or was this a suicide? Well, the jury is out on, on that one, and uh, we, we'll, we'll probably never know. And uh, I suppose if it's like many other these things regarding Amy, every effort was made you know, to cover up, uh, cover up stuff. Uh, I think she always had problems with her with her kidneys and stuff, and she she it was known to use uh, pretty used drugs, pretty uh, uh, legitimate ones. Uh, may I may I put it that way? Sleeping pills, you see, that sort of thing. So we'll never know. Amy had a huge fi uh, f funeral in L.A. Hundreds of cars going out to Forest Lawn. She's a huge monument out there, almost forgotten now. They. Uh, they did a television st uh, history of her, starring Faye Dunaway, totally miscast, as Amy, and Betty Davis as the mother, Mock Kennedy, and once again, totally miscast. Uh, there was an effort to, uh, Rosalind Russell, many of you may remember her in film. She was, uh, her great success, of course, was the Annie Mame thing. She was much interested in doing it as a musical on Broadway but nothing happened. And more recently, this, Griff, uh, this Griffith thing is she is a, uh, a, a television personality uh, on, I think, on the, on the American Broadcasting. Th is she, uh, I can't think, of, at any rate, she has been interested in and tried to float a, 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 a musical, uh, but apparently didn't get the money or the, or the uh, critical acclaim, and so, and so it's sort of dead in the water. So Amy was pretty much a forgotten thing, except that I've revived her for you. Be grateful for that, folks. I've given, I've given new life to Amy.